Obviously, the first step is, you know, talk to your manager. So whoever you report to, talk to them. And normally what we do or in most companies is have a technical lead role. So that'll normally be maybe your manager has 10 direct reports and there's a smaller team of five and you can sort of run the sprints or start doing some certain things one-on-ones with the team, help to give advice, maybe mentor a more junior developer. So that's typically the path and it's sort of a taster. So you're not necessarily having to negotiate salary day one, but you can kind of start to, to take that leadership role. Um, and then normally once you've been doing that for a, you know six months to a year, depends on, on you know your, how things go, uh, we tend to change the title to manager and then give you more people. And as a percentage, the time that you're coding would slowly go down um, until you're at my point where it's, it's definitely zero percent of the time. Be a decent developer. So one of the reasons why I, I always, like I don't want somebody to be a junior developer who gets along with people or maybe is outgoing. And then I oh, will make a manager. They're not very good at being a developer. Um, I don't believe you can effectively lead technology teams without having a great sense for technology. To um, it, it doesn't mean you need to. You're obviously not going to be the architect, um, but you at least need to be in my mind what a senior engineer would be. Um, so that's number one. Um, and then number two, I would say, and this is a little more abstract, but you know, practicing empathy. And let me be clear about what empathy is. Empathy, sometimes people think of as sympathy. So you're crying because you feel bad for everyone in the world. Um, no, empathy is when you can understand where somebody else is thinking. So what their thought process is. You can put yourself in their shoes and understand them. Um, that is probably the most valuable skill um, that you should always be practicing. If somebody is acting in a way that doesn't make sense to you, stop and think about it. Think, why would this person act that way? And that muscle is super useful for leadership because when I uh, tell somebody they're not getting a raise, right? I need to I need to understand how they're going to hear me, and I need to make sure we're having that conversation in a productive way. I have to understand them; otherwise, they're going to get angry, they're going to get burned out, they're going to throw things, <laughs> and they might do that anyway. But it's uh, at least <laughs> minimizes the chance. So in my experience, the pay differential isn't actually that large. Um, it, it really isn't. Now, that might not be true for all companies, especially the type of company. Um, so like, you know, client service oriented companies are obviously going to value people who go out and speak or working with clients are going to get valued more. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, in product focused companies, I mean, maybe 20% more, if that. Um, but typically, because to us, a print, so like, I. Google, for instance, their highest pay bands are not, I mean, you know, a lot of them are developers. They're the people who are behind the scenes building out Google Cloud. Um, they are not um, the titled people necessarily. So, you know, I would do not go into it for the money. That is, not, um, it, if, I want to be clear also, those senior levels of technology, there's a point where, you know, you can only know so much about code. Like, I think junior developers think that, you know, I mean, you'll never know everything, right? But your skills and ability to quickly pick up a new programming language or understand a new paradigm, those can grow pretty quickly. Um, but the real skills at, what's the difference between a principal engineer and a staff engineer or a senior? Usually those are the ability to drive change, not just in themselves, but around them. And so that's where, like, you're not going to get promoted in my organization to architect unless you are mentoring junior people, you've got, you're writing this amazing documentation, training everybody on the coolest, newest tech, and then doing a whole initiative to tackle tech debt. Like that's to me is a type of leadership. Um, and those, those roles are very extremely well paid. So um, I would not make the decision. Uh, I'd make it off of, you know, what do you actually enjoy? What gets you excited? Because once again, you're not going to go write all that documentation and do all that extra work and put together the training if you're not excited about it. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a long one. Um, no, it's funny. My actual, the first time I, I didn't think I'd get into leadership and I actually kind of fell into it accidentally. So my first job, um, I was a college dropout and, uh, apparently in the early two thousands after the dot com bust, if you don't have a college degree, nobody was going to hire you as a programmer. I found that out late. Um, I ended up getting, uh, hired by a small team of people in, uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, where I was living at the time. 
and uh, they brought me on as their first hire um, of a small development shop. And what ended up happening was there was a the managing director of this this company. He, I was the first hire. We grew really fast. That's where I came up with Hamel while there in SaaS. Uh, it's a company. It's no, no longer around, but called Unspace. And what actually happened was the managing partner, uh, who's now at Microsoft, is a, a very senior product person. He left the company to join Microsoft. He's been there for oh, 15 years now, I guess. Um, and I was, I guess, 22, 23. And uh, all of a sudden, none of the rest of the remaining partners had um, like a ton of background in leadership or interest in it. They were more interested in design and being a programmer. So I actually kind of just stepped up into the role of helping to run the business. And that was a, I, yeah, because I had to, there wasn't, like we didn't really have a, a choice. And so I started building those skills there. It, it was kind of accidental. Um, I mean, since then, you know, I've, I've gone on to run a bunch of these open source projects. Um, yeah, I mean, I got basically by inventing things and putting things online, you know, I, I, I got a role as CTO at a company called MoveWeb. Um, it started small, we ended up growing pretty big. Um, but yeah, I've, I've also been founder, uh, CEO of a couple startups. Um, Rent the Runway is me kind of coming to a large organization. You know, we're, we're at over a billion dollars valuation right now. It's, it's a much larger organization than the ones I've been at previously. Um, it's just different. It's it's different scale, different size, uh, and uh, yeah, who knows what's next? Well, first of all, I y'all might laugh about this. Uh, I would recommend getting a career or life coach earlier. Um, I know that's a bit of a goofy thing to admit to, but you know, building confidence and belief in yourself, I think, is the thing that I. Uh, I, I put out a lot of confident energy. Uh, I always have, but I think actually believing in myself behind the scenes and knowing that I can make a difference and I can do this and that I I can I can make the changes I need to make. I guess is the you have to have a belief in yourself because, like I said, towards the the top, you you get very little positive feedback. I mean, to be honest, um, it it is it's you really do have to sort of find it in yourself because especially during challenging times like now, right? People come to you and they, they're concerned and they have questions and they have things going on in their life. And you, you have to find a certain strong center place to, to hold on to. Um, and nobody else is going to do that for you. Um, and so, and honestly, if I had done that, I think I probably would have stuck to one of my earlier startups longer and it'd probably be a success. <laughs> so that's what would be different. <laughs> 